Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Goalkeepers Podcast. Uh, working today, collaborating with um, female footballers, and, and very lucky to have Cassie Gray on today. Uh, and we're going to be continuing our discussion on mental health. Um, and, and we're probably going to jump all over the place. Um, we're going to try to talk about uh, coaches and mental health, um, you know, and, and trying to figure out how um, how you can help your coach, you know, in you know the coach in your life, right, and in your kid's life. Because um, ultimately what we want to do is just try to – make life a little bit easier, uh, try to bring some recognition around some of the issues that we as coaches have and, um, and certainly, um, continue the discussion on mental health and sports and, and, um, uh, soccer players, of course. So, um, Cassie, please uh, tell us about you. Where are you? What do you do? What do female followers do? All right. So my name is Cassie Gray and, um, I'm based in the Bay area in California, San Jose area. And I started female footballers in 2015, or excuse me, 2014, um, kind of on and off after I had my daughter, I started to think about like, what is the soccer world gonna be like post playing? So I, I grew up in this area and I played competitive soccer my whole life and I ended up getting a scholarship to UC Berkeley. And I played four years there and I was part of the youth national teams up until about 18. Um, and then I took, you know, 10 years after graduating off, my husband was a MLS player. He played for the mm -hmm. Earthquakes. Chicago Fire, the LA Galaxy, Colorado Rapids, and the Houston Dynamo. And so we traveled around a bunch and I was in that world for a while. And then, yeah, once we had my daughter, I started to think more about the women's game and what that might look like for my own daughter. And I uh, started to realize there was a lot of the same issues that I thought would have gone away after the 99ers had their kind of boom and, and the WSA had its time and, and the WPS at the time was around. And so I was Kind of frustrated that it wasn't where I wanted it to be as far as more whole player development. I started to write and my husband is an entrepreneur now and he looked at it and he was like, this is like a business, like this is an opportunity. And so I started doing camps and clinics for a few years, but again, I had another kid. So I have three kids and um, I just couldn't make it all work. And so 2020, I was like, all right, this is going to be the year we're going to go like full force and then COVID hit. <laughs> but I started doing a lot of virtual talks about a lot of the research I'd done for the last six years on mental health within the sport. And we started to, uh, I started to kind of gain traction and um, attention for some of the things I was saying. And a lot of girls started to join what I was all about. And we started to create some curriculum around uh, mental skills training um, in a mentorship environment. So everybody on our staff, uh, we are current or former female athletes and players. Uh, we have pro and collegiate players. Um, we all want to give back to the sport, so we do a lot of volunteering of our time. Um, everyone has a different type of background in their kind of academic fields. Um, I bring curriculum development as an educator and a psychological background as a psych major. Um, we have a lot of different people involved who do a lot of different things, but we create we created some online courses um, and we started to kind of do Zoom sessions for teams and clubs and you know, as time has gone on since 2020 with COVID, everybody um, kind of has understood a little bit more about what we're talking about as, as the mental health challenges have gotten larger for our youth and, and collegiate athletes and even pro athletes. And so we, um, we definitely um, have gotten some attention, but, you know, we're, we're a little frustrated that it's not going faster. <laughs> so... Yeah. And, and I think that, um, there's a lot of value to what you do, what your work, you know, your work obviously. And so, so I'm wondering why, why is it important for female soccer players to have female role models and females that are going to lead the charge on mental health for, for female players? Um, well, and I think this is one of those like controversial topics, because I think I grew up in a time, graduated high school in 2000, and at that time, the 99ers were really big, and it was the first time we had some female representation, but growing up as a kid, a lot of my idols were men. Um, you know, I grew up in the Bay Area, so in 96, the Clash were big. I went to the first Clash game for MLS, and it was like, that was the exciting the, you know, the men were the on TV the most, but as I was 16 was the year the 99ers kind of won the World Cup, and that was the first time I'd seen women uh, as representing our country, women on TV playing the sport that I loved, 
And so it just became one of those things where I really, um, I really, it resonated with me to be able to see what I could be on TV. And so um, as a female, I just feel like there's a lack of representation and visibility for youth uh, athletes. And I think whether or not, the part that's controversial in this is, um, you know, a lot of people can say soccer is soccer, regardless of gender. But I do think that if you watch a women's game and a men's game, they play very differently. You know, you've got a different style of play and you also have different reasons for why different genders join in on the sport. Um, you know, statistically, girls join the sport uh, at a young age and stay within it when there are there's a level of camaraderie and friendship. Um, that's also what creates a lot of the mental health issues, too, <laughs> ironically. Um, but they stay within the sport also because they're competitive. They want to win and all those things and they want to improve technically and tactically and all that kind of stuff. But but ultimately, the reasons why we join the sport are different. The way we play is different. And so the supports that we have for the different sides of the game need to slightly be different, I think. Yeah. And I don't usually say this, right, because I don't I can't, I can't usually usually say this. And that's, you know, I, I can't, you know, I'm going to speak for for the United Goalkeeping Alliance and say that's how we feel about goalkeepers as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Where being a goalkeeper is a completely different um, um, animal in itself as far as um, the emotions, the technical, tactical, the demands. Um, and it's not to compare the male and female part. I'm just it's just, it, you know, just kind of sort of state that that's why we do what we do. Right. As far mm -hmm. as um, providing all the resources and all that stuff that we do for goalkeeping and goalkeepers and all that good stuff. Um so, so today, you know, we, we, we have this series and we're going to talk about a lot of different things, but today I wanted to focus on coaches and some of those issues that maybe coaches go through that a lot of uh, parents, the players, um, even we as coaches don't recognize that we go through. Um, uh, one of the things that you just mentioned was, you know, as as kids grow up and you know when they go from like club to college and then move on to pro a lot of these tools and resources are pretty much the same you know obviously they change because there's an adult you know obviously you become an adult so the needs are different the language is different but how do these tools help you know that eight you know that 15 16 year old but can also help um the player that's trying to make pro or playing pro or even coaches? Well, I think first of all, there's sort of, within the sport, I think there's confusion as to what mental health and mental skills are. We define um, mental health um, as, you know, just the mindset, the mentality behind the sport in the game. And when, it, when we talk about mental skills, um, we talk about whole player development. So, you know, you have your technical, your tactical, your physical, and your mental. And in my personal opinion, I feel like those supports are actually slightly different at each stage of, of the game. The youth age, there really are barely any mental skills and mindset or whatever you want to call it, psychological supports for players, unless you're at a really big club, um, unless the parents surrounding the club advocate for somebody within the club to, to have curriculum or to have a person that is in charge of that on your staff. Um, at the collegiate level, it's kind of similar where there's supports, but usually only at the largest, biggest programs and schools. I played at UC Berkeley, so at a, a Pac-12 school, we have that support, but it was still minimal. It was still somebody who shared amongst the different uh, sports. You know, we were sharing a psychologist with football and basketball and all those other big sports. And as a women's soccer program, we're going to have kind of the last choice, you know, compared to those bigger money-making sports. Um, and then the pro level, I think that they probably have the most supports. But even then, I think it depends on, again, like how it's valued within the program. And that really can vary depending on the coach, the GM, uh, the organization as a whole. Yeah. And one of the things that you mentioned in, in uh, you know, in a recent podcast was that parents have a lot more say than they think. And parents have a lot more pool than they think. Um, I believe that to be true. And I, and I also think that, um, they can leverage it for a lot of really, really good things. Um, you know, not only for support for their players, but support for the coaches as well. Um, 
So can you speak to why do you think that parents don't realize that they are as strong as they are um, and that they can um, influence um, decision and decision makers more so than than they think? Yeah, and I first I want to preface this by I am a parent of two competitive soccer players. So what, what I'm going to say might sound mean or rude at times. I'm also one of those parents. But I do think that soccer is one of the biggest sports that youth, you know, athletes play at a young age. You have parents who join the sport because their kid is interested. They want to run around. They want to get them tired. They want them to play with their friends. So they'll join a club based on if the friend is joining. They'll also often join the club that's in their neighborhood. So they don't have to drive as far to drop their kid off at practice. But once you're in that club, and let's say you're starting at five or six years old, a lot of the time they don't want to leave. Um, but what I feel like ends up happening is they also don't do the research on what the club is all about and the club philosophy. And that club philosophy, if you stay and you don't believe in it, you do have a say in, in speaking up. And I think the hard part is when you're kind of uneducated about the soccer world and the fact that it's a billion dollar industry, you're going to get kind of duped sometimes on what's important and what's not important. And ultimately, I think as sports parents, we all get wrapped up in, you know, the competitiveness, the winning. And if you're at the type of club where that comes first over development, you're going to think that's normal. If you're in a club that's touting development over winning, you're going to think that's normal. And it's sort of like, unless you have a background in the sport. Um, but even then, I have to be honest, I think that there are many parents who played that didn't get to the level they wanted to get to. And they're a little more intense, whereas the players, I think, that made it as far as as whatnot, like they, they don't have as much of a push. I, I know that's a bit controversial to say, but um, I think that you know, you're, if your club is touting like data, for example, like data is the most important thing right now. It's kind of a buzzword in, in the technical side of the sport. There's all these tech companies coming out with devices for shoes and stuff like that. If your director of coaching is touting that to parents, then as a parent, if you don't know any better. You're like, yeah, let's, let's buy all the things, let's spend all the money. But if you do your homework and you're sort of a level-headed adult, I think you could kind of see that like, you know, the reason for sport, a lot of the purpose of sport, um, especially at the younger ages, those reasons shouldn't go away. They shouldn't all of a sudden shift. And just like the parents can join a board and decide whether or not their kid is on the A and B and C team and have that kind of pull, you could use that pull for the good of the whole club and the mental health of your child too. Okay. So, um, so we're going to, when we talk about, like, for example, if, if, if normally, or at least when I was a younger coach, that parent that was on the board would scare me, right? Mm -hmm. It's very scary. How does how does a coach one get over that? Can can you get over that fear? I mean, I you know, um, how do you get over that fear, right? How do you get over the fear of the meddling parent or the parent that is it over involved or is on the board? or is a decision making a decision maker absolutely so and and so i'm a teacher in my day job and i can equate everything in the soccer world to teaching so as a teacher i'm like a coach my principal is like a doc the superintendent is like you know the head of the league or something like that and as a teacher i am responsible just like coaches are to create a culture on the team where the parents know to come to me first now that's not always going to happen i'm i'm realistic and i know a lot of parents are going to skip you as a coach. They're going to go straight to the DOC when there's a problem, which I have the same issue in teaching. There's parents that go straight to my principal or even straight to the district office and they want to complain about something. And I think this is where your relationship with your director and the head of your club is really, really important. And to not coach for a club that you, one, don't agree with the philosophy, two, where you feel supported. You know, you don't want to feel like the director is just trying to please the parents. You wanna feel like the director has your back and in those coaches meetings once a month, you guys are creating a culture where it's okay to talk about this stuff, where it's okay. And that director feels like, you know, they have your back. Um, and I think there's so many different types of coaches as there are teachers, for example, some coaches get in the sport because to coach because they love soccer. Some coach because they felt like they were a really good player and they wanna pass along their knowledge. Some get into the sport for the money. 
some, and I think this is where it's tricky because everyone's purpose for getting in the sport is different and that's going to change their mentality on coaching a little bit. And that culture with your director is hundred percent really important. And I have seen firsthand um, directors being fired, coaches being fired because of parents just, and there's very difficult parents. So I have a lot of empathy for coaches in that regard. And even today, the amount of stuff we're asking coaches to do is larger than it's ever been. And we're not always supporting that. I agree. I, I wholeheartedly agree. And um, I believe that you're right. There, there, there is a lot of work behind the scenes because um, a lot of times parents, and, and unless maybe you're the manager or maybe the treasurer, you don't get to see that part right? You just kind of sort of think like, you know, the games appear on the website and you just show up to games and, <laughs> mm -hmm. that, you know, um, so, so from that perspective, should, how much should, how much should coaches share to the parents, right? How much of my workload should I, should my parents know that I, that I have, and should I let them know, um, you know, cause, cause part of it too is, um, we just maybe assume that they know, Right. As a coach, I assume that they know that um, I don't only work that hour and a half during training. It's it's the other stuff behind it. And then it's scheduling the games and talking to the other coaches and the, the coaches meetings and the curriculum. And, you know, on what are we going to work on this week? Um, and even like the wins and the losses when you go home is very difficult, you know, to to deal with that sometimes especially if you don't have a supportive um, environment at home. So mm -hmm. how much of that should the parents know and how much should we share of that? I think it's important that they know. I mean, I look at a, a team as a family and obviously you're as the coach, you're the one that needs to be the most professional, but you set the tone and you are responsible for that culture on your team, regardless of your director. At the end of the day, you know, my principal, for example, can tell me all the different things I need to do in a classroom. But at the end of the day, I'm the one with those kids and I'm going to be the one that kind of sets the tone in my classroom. And every coach is kind of different when as to how that might look. But it, in my opinion, it's important to bring in the whole, the, the mental side, the whole player development. So that parents do see that a lot of the things that you're having to do are more of the social emotional side, because a lot of people don't see that. And that's the hardest part about mental health and the mental side of the game is you can't see it. It's not tangible. And I think that's what parents do need to know is you see us working on our technical ability. You see me coaching in a game, the tactical side from the sidelines, you see us doing the physical, you know, repetitions and practice, but you don't see all the things I'm doing mentally. But I do think on both sides, I think coaches need to do a better job of actually setting time aside in training sessions for mental skills. Outside of mental skills, don't, when I say that, I mean, I don't think that mental skills should just be um, put in a session where it's like you're scrimmaging and it's all of a sudden like, oh, you need to whatever, like talk about confidence while they're playing. I think you actually need to sit them down, give them a piece of paper and do a type of activity that's related to confidence that's different. And I think if parents start to see that there's value, that you're putting value on the social emotional side of the sport, they're going to see that that's important to you. And I think they'll see that that's a whole nother layer that you're providing that is important. So you can really bring about attention. I had this situation happen in my classroom this week where you know, a parent was upset that I moved their daughter down in a reading group. She's a, the highest, you know, reader in my class, but I moved her down because she has crazy amounts of anxiety. And I had to, and then, you know, the mom was like, you know, she's an incredible reader. It was, the focus was super academic and it was about, you know, the high numbers. And I had to say, part of my job is her social emotional learning. And um, I, I don't think I'm going to get her to the level of success that she's capable of unless I put her in an environment that makes her feel safe and comfortable to learn. So maybe we're not challenging her at the highest academic, but we're challenging her to work on her skills or coping skills for anxiety. And that is just as important in my opinion, as it is to get her to a high reading level. And as the teacher, that's my job to show parents, these are just as important. And um, we're in a you know, day and age where people just look at the numbers, they look at the wins and loss records, and they're not always looking at the whole player and what it's going to mean when they're done with the sport, you know? And and so so how does that look like for a coach, right? So 
Um, it's like you kind of like what you're exactly what you're saying, right? The, the, the parents show up to the field, the coach is there, they have the pug goal set up, they have a hundred cones laid out. So visually it's very appealing. It's very nice. And Oh, the, the coach knows what they're doing. And, and I look at the, t- you know, they were here 30 minutes early and they set everything up. So this guy's got, or this girl has to know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. How do we change that mindset? I think it's going to come from, uh, I mean, you know, I think right now society is going from the top down. They're looking at the pro level, the women's national team, men's national team. They're looking at the the collegiate level um, in all the mental health. But I truly think that it has to start from the ground up, in my opinion. And that starts with um, even coaches and parents going to the club and saying, like, isn't this something that's important? You know, we have a lot more power as coaches and parents to bring about what we want to see within the club. And I think that um, we have to normalize whole player development. At the end of the day, I, you know, I'm going to be the first to argue that our pro and national teams are the best in the world. They're not. Even our women's national team is not the best in the world right now. I don't care how much technical skill stuff they're working. I don't care how much data tracking they're doing and all the different devices and whatever there's a culture issue. There's an issue amongst players. There's an issue with, with um, the mindset and the mental side of the game. And if we don't start to address that, we're just going to keep falling farther behind. So I I do, I don't know that I answered your question great, but I I do think that the coach needs to uh, set the tone. I think communication is key. I think that there should be more emails than they think they should send. I think they should be inviting of parents to come out and and watch a session and and have answers ready for when they question them and not be afraid to talk to a parent. Um, I think that level of confidence in a coach is really important because that's going to sway a parent a lot. And I think that if a parent, you know, still questions them, you invite them to have a meeting with your director if you feel like your director has your back, you know, but again, it, it means that you're your sessions, your curriculum, your culture have to be really strong. And that means coaches have to work on that. They have to write it down. They have to present it in a way where it comes across like strong. And I think a lot of coaches just show up and they they do the sessions that they're given. I, I don't think they're always given a lot of support in this regard. And I think they should speak up to their directors for more support and to have more of a unified front of the philosophy behind what they're doing. So, so how does that get addressed in, in a world of, uh, you know, on the go? Because, you know, as a coach, right, um, you're right, there's session planning, um, then there's the communication, and then there's, uh, you know, you have to deal with players sometimes one-on-one, mm-hmm. and you have the games on the weekend, and for more, most coaches, um, you know, most co- the majority of the coaches that I know have multiple teams. So you mm-hmm. have to multiply that times two. Mm-hmm. I am extremely fortunate that I coach full time, so I don't have that morning job. Mm-hmm. Most coaches do. Mm-hmm. So you're so now you're talking about two, three, sometimes four teams, and then the day job. And then the family. Mm-hmm. So, uh, how how big is that toll? You know, um, and not physically, right? You know, because the physical part, you, you can't see the physical part. I mean, they're exhausted, tired, mm-hmm. not focused. Um, you know, flippant, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, where you just show up and you just kind of put the cones down and you do the same session four times and you get through the night and you're done, right? Mm-hmm. And then the next day is the same thing. But the mental part, the mental side. So, how, how how big a toll is that on the mental side of somebody who's trying to live that life? I think it's it's so hard. And again, I feel that in like my day job of teaching, it's the same feeling. As a coach, you're you're not appreciated enough, um, and not just by the parents or the players, but by your own club. A lot of the time, um, the what you're being asked to do is just more and more every year, and the payment isn't always changing, right? Um, And this is why it's a systemic issue. It's not something that we can fix overnight. Um, But I do think um, advocating for yourself, it can go far. I do think that as far as the system goes, 
there needs to be supports in place for coaches, just like there are for players. And I think that might look like, um, you know, where your, your club offers um, just different, uh, different opportunities. Like there needs to be mental health days for coaches, just like we need them for players. And just like we need them, um, there needs to be the ability to take time off. Like you, you know, have a weekend where you take a break, you know? And I think that the hardest part to me is that, like you said, most coaches coach three to four teams in my area, at least. So they don't have that kind of time. And clubs are so spread thin, they can't seem to get the coaches. Same issue we have in teaching. There's a teacher shortage and a mass exodus in my profession, I think. And there's a bit of an exodus in, in um, coaching as well, because it's such a, you know, unappreciated uh, space. And I think, um, I, I think, it's it, there's I don't have like the perfect answer, but I do think self care is really important, and self care can look like many things. I think everybody hears that word and they think, oh, it's a bubble bath. No, it's not a bubble bath. It's balance. It's making sure that you are putting the time into other things that give you a balance and provide that. Um, it's communicating your needs to your club, to your parents, to your players. It's also showing your players that like, you know what, we all need. You know, we had a game yesterday. It's Sunday. Today's Monday. We're gonna take the day off. That's your, you know, we can cancel practice and I want you guys to go home and not do anything related to soccer and give yourself that break too. Um, and if parents ask, be like, you know, this is part of the mental training for us. We need to take a break and that's okay too. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that I would also add, I mean, you mentioned this in, in, the, in, that, in that podcast as far as um, how we fill our time and our space, you know, when you have that night off because it's raining. Don't mm -hmm. automatically fill it, right? Don't, mm -hmm. uh, don't, you know, don't say, well, you know, now I'm going to go do this when you know, very, you mentioned it, you know, very well, you were going to go do those sessions and you were not going to get anything done that night. Um, so take that night off and, and really um, give yourself an opportunity to, to just regenerate, refresh all that good stuff. Um, the other thought that comes to my mind is um, obviously we have a, a system in the U.S. of pay to play. So it's very parent driven. All the funding comes from the parents. Everybody knows that. That's not a secret. Um, are we failing as a society to fund some of this stuff? Because, I, I, you know, and, and I've had this discussion before where. Um, a lot of the funding and a lot of the resources that we have and that we use and um, I'm going to go a little deeper now. They're, they're used to solve problems, not to prevent them. Right. So, uh, yeah. you know, it's kind of, it's kind of that, that like, well, I'm going to go spend my money on the gym. Right. You know, cause I got to go get in shape and I got to go get fit when that money could have been used to eat better. Mm -hmm. Right. Or you're spending that money on the medicine and not the gym. So it, is there is there there's no easy yeah. fix right but no no there's no easy fix but a hundred percent agree with you and i think this is my biggest frustration with the mental side of the game in sport is just like right now unfortunately after the death of katie meyer this has been a really big discussion and you know there's a lot of talk about putting more mental resources at the collegiate level which is very important i don't disagree with that but i'm over here saying why aren't we providing mental skills curriculum and time and effort put into that side of things for our youth players so that we help them create better habits and it becomes something they're practicing from age six on instead of trying to slap a band-aid on it at 18 through 22 when they've already created a lot of these habits and i'm not saying that a mental illness um, and what katie meyer had was um you know, something that could have been changed or prevented. I don't know her and I'm not here to speak on that, but I will say that I played with a ton of girls that created habits of, of negative self-talk, of low self-esteem, with eating disorders, all these things that if there were more supports at ages 10 to 15 for them, where there were outlets to discuss it, where there was resources to learn about it, those issues might not have been as prevalent at the collegiate level. We don't know until we try to have those supports in place. But as far as pay to play, I'm 100% against it. And I think that's the hardest part is part of our job at Female Footballers is, is twofold. It's one, to push back against the system that I really have struggled with. And it's what I was writing about in 2014 of how it had gotten way worse in that regard than I thought it would from my days as a player. Um, 
And then it's also our job to, if we can't change the system after that, because it's a systemic issue, that's not something that's going to change overnight, then we need to put resources and, and supports in place at all levels to start, you know, working through this. And so, yeah, the pay to play model is very frustrating. I don't have a solution. Um, I think if we all did, we would be working towards it. But honestly, I think that's my biggest frustration with the parents. And this is where I have a lot of empathy for coaches is it shouldn't be that parents dictate your whole job. It shouldn't be that parents can get you fired. It shouldn't be any of that. You know, it's it's a billion dollar industry and it's so political now. And it makes me sad even for my own children to be a part of it. And even like this weekend, I was at a kind of a jamboree play date for my daughter. It's her first time on her, her new team. There's three 45 minute games where everyone's from there from eight to four all day. And I'm just watching different games occur and listening to conversations, with parents on the sidelines. And I want to pull my hair out because I'm like, oh my God, you have no clue. You're just starting in this world and you think this and you're wrong and I can't say any of it. You know, I'm just listening. And, you know, I'm also watching my my daughter's coach go from field to field because he coaches three teams and he's not getting a break to even eat. And, you know, and it's just, there's so many problems with it that I think we're doing our kids a massive disservice. But like I said, I don't have a solution. So it's hard to listen to somebody just always complaining about it without a solution. Um, my way of trying to give that solution is, Start younger, start ages six to 12, provide mental skills resources in clubs with four coaches, four parents, um, and, and make that a part of your club's uh, curriculum and philosophy, you know, more whole player development, not just the word development, which is such a buzzword, which for so many clubs, they just use the word and they don't actually follow it, but actually do it, you know? No, I know. <laughs> I, I think that with coaches, in particular coaches, what ends up happening is um, a lot of us, you know, may have the tools and, and the resources and all that other stuff to provide it to uh, to players, to provide that information to players. But um, again, it, it costs money and it takes time. And if we don't have that backing, it becomes very difficult, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, if the players come first then we are secondary and we don't take care of ourselves uh, so you know it just becomes even a, a, a less of a priority mm -hmm. um so so it's super important that we as coaches take kind of take that power back a little bit and just realize that it does lie within us to get that mentor get those mm -hmm. tools get that time back and um you know make sure that we put ourselves in an environment where we we're we're thriving you know we're not just surviving um mm -hmm. easier said than done for sure yeah. um so as we wrap this up um cassie uh you know can you give us just your final thoughts on um coaches players you know mental health and maybe something that we can do um as coaches as directors as administrators um to help each other out I think there needs to be more support um, outside of your club. I mean, I feel like that even as a teacher, like I don't always feel safe to go talk to fellow teachers or somebody within my school or my district about my job because, you know, it doesn't always feel safe to, to open up like that. And I'm sure coaches feel that way. There needs to be outside groups where coaches can meet. I know there's United Soccer Coaches and those types of groups, but even smaller on a smaller scale within your city, your town or your, your county or something like that. Um, and the hardest part is in coaching, unfortunately, there's, you know, you feel like you're competing against these people, but you all have a, a shared interest. Um, and so what we do at Female Footballers, um, I feel like to me is one of the, a great solution. I'm club neutral. I'm not a coach. I don't coach. Um, I have for many years, but I don't currently coach. Um, I do private trainings, but um, I hold monthly meetings for coaches and we talk about this kind of stuff. So it's really just a, and it's free. So a free monthly meeting to discuss the issues that you're having, where you can meet like-minded people all over the country who are also going through it. And then we try to give takeaways, you know, tangible things that you can do every now and then we'll give like a session game or activity that you can implement with mental skills to address some of the culture issues or the mental skills issues that your team might be having. Um, those More of those types of things need to be offered, especially um, for low money or free, because coaches don't have the means to put their extra money they make into these types of things. I mean, even me as a as a coach, like 
if there, and even as a teacher, like if there's the option to spend $300 to go to a, a training or something, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to spend, I have the same issue in teaching. It's like, if I want to get continuing ed, it's $300 for one unit. And I need like 10 units to do something. I'm like, I'm not going to spend that money, you know? So we need to make more resources available for, for lower money or even for free if we truly care about this. And I think that we're to the point where we have to all truly care and make it make it work. You know, these symposiums and talks that different organizations hold, those are really important if they're low money to try to listen in and, and do the extra kind of work. Like you said, that we don't always have that time, but when it's a Zoom and stuff, you can have an AirPod in and you could be doing other things and still trying to learn and listen. I know that's a lot of multitasking, but, um, you know, I do think sometimes that's helpful. And a lot of them are recorded, so you can watch them on your own time. That's fantastic. I love that. And um, so, so please tell us, wh where can we find you? Where can we find female footballers? How do I get in touch? How do I join these meetings? Yeah, yeah. So um, you, we have a website. It's female footballers. Football is spelled like, um, like American football dot org. Um, we have all the information on there. Um, my email is Cassie, K-A-S-S-I-E at female footballers dot org. I'm kind of the, the go to person to discuss how we can help. Um, we are pretty active on different social platforms, specifically LinkedIn and Instagram and Facebook. Um, and we often have links on, on there to our free meetings and things like that. Um, and we just we just encourage people to join the community. You know, we post a lot of resources. We post a lot of things to think about that you can share and start the conversation, which can't be a bad thing, in my opinion. Yeah, we, we here at the UGKA appreciate your your time, your expertise, and um, and yeah, we, we look forward to continuing this discussion and um, collaborating in the future. So thank yeah, you very thank much. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. I don't know.